Welcome to the final video of the Algorithms series. As we've explored algorithms, we've already talked quite a bit about efficiency and how a few of the algorithms compare. We'll finish up this video by looking at how algorithm efficiency is documented, a concept called complexity analysis. Suppose we want to pick a sort algorithm to use in our program. We can go to the Wikipedia page for sorting algorithm and see a list of a couple dozen algorithms to choose from. Merge sort is here, and here are insertion sort and selection sort that we learned about. But what are all these numbers? n, n log n, n squared? These are complexity analysis ratings. They can help us understand the efficiency of each algorithm. Algorithms have different ratings for how much time they require and how much computer memory they require. In this article, the first three columns are related to time, how many operations the program must make to complete the sort. The memory column is related to how much computer memory the algorithm takes to complete. Both of these factors are worth taking into account. Some algorithms may be faster but require more memory, or vice versa. The distinction can be important depending on what environment you're programming in, but we do tend to pay more attention to time than memory. Notice that this is broken up into best, average, and worst. Think back to our search algorithms. With a linear search, there is a best case where, by chance, we find our value in the first slot. That only takes one operation. And there's a worst case. If the value is at the very end, we have to check every single value before we find it. That takes 10 operations for a list of 10 elements. But on average, we'll probably find our value somewhere in between, about five operations. So there's a best, a worst, and an average. As a rule of thumb, the worst case is the most important because your users will most remember the one time that it took 30 seconds for your page to load and not the 99 times when it only took one second. Let's look at the most common algorithm ratings. These are expressed in what's called big O notation. The format is a capital letter O, which stands for order, followed by a mathematical expression involving the letter N. N represents the amount of data or the number of elements that need to be processed. For example, the length of our array. Luckily, you do not have to understand the math behind these expressions. Just know that they represent different curves on a graph. The idea is that as the amount of data or the number of elements increases along the horizontal axis, the amount of time or space required grows on the vertical axis at different rates. Take for example, big O, N. That's a straight line. That means that when the amount of data, N, doubles, the time it takes to process roughly doubles. This line describes the linear search algorithm we looked at. It takes an average of five operations to search a list of 10 elements, double that list to 20 elements, and the average doubles from five to 10 operations. Another curve here is order n squared. That's an exponential line. This would be like insertion sort, Suppose it takes 60 operations to sort a list of 10 items. If you double the length of the list, you quadruple the number of operations from 60 to 240. At this rate, performance can get very bad very quickly as the array grows. Generally, we want to avoid order n squared algorithms if possible when working with a lot of data. In this graph, different ratings of algorithms are shown in excellent, good, fair, bad, and horrible areas. Notice that the more quickly the curve goes up from the bottom, the worse it is. In order from best to worst, the big O categories are order one, order log n, order n, order n times log n, order n squared, order two to the power n, and order n factorial. The very best is order one. One does not mean that it takes only one operation, but rather that however many operations it takes, it is constant. 
it is the same no matter how much or how little data is involved. It might be helpful to see some concrete examples in code. Let's look at three of the most basic orders. Order 1, order n, and order n squared. These code snippets are in C-sharp, but even if that's not your language, you should be able to get the idea. Let's start with order n. This code loops through an array from beginning to end. If there are 10 items in the array, it will loop 10 times. If there are 20 items, it will loop 20 times. When the array length doubles, the loops double. That's the definition of order n. This code demonstrates the rule of thumb that when you have a single loop, it's usually order n. But let's look at another example of order n. In this example, there are two loops, one after the other. The first loop counts through the array from beginning to end, and the second loop back from end to beginning. So if there are 10 items in the array, there are a total of 20 times through the loop, 10 for each loop. If there are 20 items, then there are 40 loop iterations. This is still considered order n because it follows a straight line on the graph. When the array size doubles, the total operations doubles. The exact number of loop iterations is not what matters. What matters is the speed at which it increases as the array gets bigger. Now let's look at an n squared example. The key here is that the loops are nested, meaning that one loop is inside the other loop. Now if we have an array of length 10, the console.write line executes 100 times. The outside loop runs 10 times, and each of those 10 times, the inner loop runs 10 times. So that's 10 times 10, which is 100. If we double the size of the array from 10 to 20, the iterations quadruples to 20 times 20 is 400 loops. The rule of thumb here is that when you have a loop inside another loop, it's generally n squared. Finally, let's look at an order one example. There are no loops here. It just takes the first and last item in the array and averages them. The size of the array has no effect on how fast this code runs. Whether it's an array of 10 or 10,000, it still only has to access two elements. This is order one. Again, this doesn't mean that the program only has one line of code. It means that as the size of the array changes, the program is unaffected. The general rule of thumb is, if there are no loops, it's order one. Let's summarize these rules of thumb. First, if code has no loops, then it is unaffected by the amount of data, it's order one. Second, if code has loops, but no loops inside one another, that's probably order n. This includes if you have several loops one after another, but not nested inside each other. Third, if you do have a loop inside another loop and both are looping through your data, that's probably n squared. Finally, we didn't look at code for this, but when you have a divide and conquer algorithm, you are probably looking at log n or n times log n. Mathematically, the log function corresponds with the idea of repeatedly dividing a problem in two. At this point, we would not expect you to be able to determine the exact big O complexity of your code. There are multiple factors involved. These rules of thumb are primarily examples to help flesh out what big O numbers mean in code. Lastly, it might be interesting to look at examples of algorithms for each category. They're listed here from best to worst complexity. An example of order one is accessing an element in an array. It doesn't matter how big the array is, accessing any element by index takes the same amount of time. The order log in example is binary search. Remember, log is mathematically related to dividing in two, so it often goes with divide and conquer algorithms. Order n is illustrated by linear search, which loops through the data one time. Merge sort and all the best comparison sort algorithms are n times log n. Some of the simpler sort algorithms like insertion and selection sort are generally 
order n squared, remember, we'll probably see nested loops in that code. In this video, we have not talked about anything that is as bad as 2 to the n power, but if you look up online a naive Fibonacci calculator, that is an example. I wrote one once, and even trying to calculate the 50th number, the program never finished running. If you're overwhelmed with this information, let's bring it back to what matters most. The key here is to be able to look up different algorithms and pick the best one for your situation. And that really just means being able to look at different big O ratings and identify which is better and worse. So let's practice. Open up the Wikipedia page for sorting algorithm and scroll down to the comparison sorts. The link is in the description below. Then answer the following questions using that page. Which has a better average case, Tim sort or bubble sort? Pause the video now and find the answer on the Wikipedia page. The Tim sort has the better average case. Tim sort is order n log n, bubble sort is order n squared n log n is better. Here's another question. Which has a better best case? Merge sort or insertion sort? Insertion sort has a better best case. n is faster than n log n. Finally, which has a better memory usage complexity? Heap sort, intro sort, or cube sort. Heap sort is the best. Order 1 is the best possible complexity. The worst of these is cube sort because n is worse than log n. All right, let's do one final exercise. Here are all the complexity expressions. Put them in order from most efficient to least efficient. One is the most efficient, then log n, n, n times log n, n squared, two to the power n, and the very worst is n factorial. That's it for algorithms. We've covered a lot of ground in this series. We defined algorithm as a finite set of steps that expresses how a specific task should be done. We wrote algorithms using flowcharts and pseudocode. We looked at two common algorithm strategies, greedy and divide and conquer. We explored searching and sorting algorithms. And finally, we touched on the big O notation for rating algorithm efficiency. You will constantly be writing algorithms in your work. You may find it useful to use flowcharts and pseudocode when thinking through problems and doing code challenges for job interviews and you may need to evaluate choices between existing algorithms when performance comes into play. You now have the foundation you need.